Well, I got a word from the Lord for us today. I got something that the Lord's going to speak to us and bless us with. It's called fix your eyes. I believe we need to fix our eyes on something that doesn't move. If there's one thing we know, the world is in constant motion. And I don't mean from gravity and the spinning. I mean the cultural norms and the morals and ethics of this world. What's right and what's wrong is constantly moving. And we need to fix our eyes on something that's stable. And that's how we find victory. And we're going to talk about that today. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 12, if you want to turn there, it's going to be on the screen. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and verses 2. The Bible says, Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses, surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. Other translations finish that by saying the author and finisher of our faith. We need to fix our eyes on the one who began it and the one who's going to end it. The one who begins the thing in our life and the one who's there at the very ending when we step into eternity. And he's the one that we look to. He's the one that we turn to. So, Father, I pray you'll bless this message. May we all experience and hear what you have to say. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Amen. You can have a seat. Thanks, guys. I love this scripture in, in Hebrews chapter 12 because it, does, it, it shares with us that we're not alone. We're not alone in the struggle. We're not alone. I mean, obviously, we're not alone. Look at us. We're in a church right now. There's like 600 people here. We're not, we know we're not alone in this, but even beyond that, we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses who's been there before. Hebrews chapter 11, the whole, the whole chapter talks about these great men and women of faith who did things that very few people have ever done. By faith, they lived lives that were strange, especially back in the Old Testament. Very few people stood up and did the things that these people did in Hebrews chapter 11. And they're named for it. By faith, they, they, they killed giants. By faith, they broke enemies. By faith, they, they built an ark. And by faith, by faith, all of these great people, even though they didn't get to experience faith like you and I can because of Jesus, they lived by faith. And now today, it says right afterwards, we are surrounded by such a great crowd of witnesses. And so it tells me that the great champions of our faith are cheering us on, but they are not the object of our focus. They may be cheering us on and they may be there in our corner and they may be seeing what's going on in our world today and, and, and saying, go for it, go for it, step in faith, but they are not the object of our faith. They're not the object of your faith. Pa Vi pa Pastor Vinny was, was dead on with Pastor Wart. He is a man that we, most of us, probably all of us, would follow anywhere because we know the Holy Ghost is with him. And he's a pastor that is... is probably the greatest pastor that I'll ever know. But he's not the object of our faith. He's not the focus. We're not to fix our eyes on Pastor Ward because he's not the author or finisher of our faith at all. Our eyes and our, 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 our heart needs to be fixed on something different. We need to fix our eyes on something stable. And so our call as believers is to be properly prepared for the race that is set out for us. Back in the day in the 40s and 50s, I, would, I saw these old clips of like Olympics, and I think I saw Malcolm Dunphy running in one of them. <laughs> but it's okay. There he is. He was first place in the joke telling. Um, but I saw the 100 meter dash, and they were scrawny, and they had shorts that were flapping in the wind. And that's how they ran the 100 meter dash. And then fast forward to today, and you see Usain Bolt run the 100-meter dash. And he's not scrawny. His thighs are about as thick as that monitor. And he can run about 600 miles an hour. And his clothes are tight form-fitting to get rid of, the, to get rid of like the air resistance so he can go faster. So this is kind of a picture of what we need to do in our walk with the, with the Lord. And as we fix our eyes on Christ, is we need to strip off the things that hold us back. We need to strip off the things that are keeping us from our best. 
to strip off the things that, 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 that drag us back when we need to be moving forward. And as believers, that's our call to be prepared to strip off the unnecessary and inhibiting devices of sin. The sin that entangles us, the sin that promises good things but pays off with negative things. That promises hope but pays off with, with sorrow. And we need to be willing and ready to fix our eyes on the idea of Jesus, on the person of Jesus, on the man of Jesus. Everything that he stands for to fix our eyes on that and just get rid of everything else because that's how we're going to win. That's how we're going to come out of this on top. So we can run this race without fainting. Everybody say, no fainting. No fainting. But they who wait on the Lord shall renew their own strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 31. We stay focused and amped up for what God has called us to do by fixing our eyes on the Lord. I remember... I remember... When Heather and I were first married, we had to go to a wedding in Montreal way back in 2004 or five or somewhere around there. And um, the, quick, uh, the quickest way to get to Montreal was through the back roads of Maine. And it takes you on quite the wild goose chase when you, when you go on it. And if we, didn't have, if we didn't have a guide showing us where to go and, and how to get there, we'd still be stuck there living in a shanty home eating bark. Because there would be no chance we could get out of it. I mean, you turn and everything looks the same. When I first moved here, when Heather and I were first married, she, she brought me here to, to, to the house and we were visiting and we went through three intersections and they were the exact same one. Like for real, they were. They weren't, but for all intents and purposes, they were the same thing. Crazy. But we had this little thing that was kind of new and fresh back in 2004 called a GPS. And you punch in this magical number where you want to go in Montreal and it says calculating in a real British voice because British people are smarter and they know where they're going. I don't know. Calculating. And then after about a few seconds, it says proceed to the highlighted route. And then we went and then and it would just tell us where to go. And let me tell you something. Every twist and every turn on that GPS, it was frightening because we went down these paths that didn't look like anybody lived there, didn't look like they go. We went on a dirt road going to a city of three million people. <laughs> didn't make sense to me. We're going to civilization where there's three million people and we're on a dirt road. This is weird. But as long as we kept our eyes focused on that prize, it doesn't matter how twisty and turny the road gets, we know where we're going. And if we took a wrong turn, <laughs> guess what it said? Recalculating. Recalculating. And that's what it is when we fix our eyes on the Lord is that we may go left and right. We may go up and down. We may take these crazy, these crazy big winding turns and it may not seem right. But if we keep our eyes fixed on Jesus, it doesn't matter how far off course we get. He recalculates it and we keep going. We keep going. Focus. Every race, no matter how long the race is, whether it's 100 meters, whether it's 400, whether it's, uh, whether it's a, 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 um, what are those long ones called? Marathons. <laughs> you can tell how many of those I've done in my life. <laughs> yes. Yes. I can rock in a chair for, you know, 26 miles, but that's about it. No matter how long a race is, if the runners had no idea where they were going, they would give up. They would be running and running and running and they would say, this is never going to end, this is never going to end. And they eventually would quit, not knowing that the finish line might be right in front of them. But every runner and every race that people go on, they know where they're going. You cannot walk this walk without a beacon. You can't walk this walk without something leading you and guiding you and directing you. And that something has to be Jesus Christ, the author and finisher of our faith. Today, this world system, more than ever, we need to fix our eyes on Jesus because it's not just about us. It's about our family. It's about our children. It's about our friends. It's about our parents. It's about everybody we know and showing them that there is something better to strive for. One of the most gut-wrenching passages of scripture for me, it may not seem all that gut-wrenching when I read it, but it's found in Judges chapter 2. And this is why we need to fix our eyes on Jesus. It says this, chapter 2, verse 6 through 10. When Joshua dismissed the people, the people of Israel, each went to his inheritance to take possession of the land. 
And the people served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders who outlived Joshua. So the people served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days that the elders outlived Joshua. And they all had seen all the great work that the Lord had done for Israel. And Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died at the age of 110. And they buried him within the boundaries of inheritance in the hill country of Ephraim, north of the mountain of Gash. And here it is. And all the generation also were gathered to their fathers. And there arose another generation after them that did not know the Lord. And all the work that they had done for Israel. There arose a generation after Joshua that didn't know the Lord. Could it be that their eyes were fixed on a man? Could it be that their eyes were fixed on a system? Could it be that their eyes were fixed on something other than the God that actually brought them out? You see, we need to be careful as believers right now to keep our eyes fixed on what God has called us to do. To have our eyes fixed on that beacon of light called Jesus Christ because we need to make sure that no matter what happens in this world, we're not going to fall. We're not going to fail. We're not going to crumble. We're not going to lose faith. We're not going to lose hope because God is stable. As a matter of fact, I want to give you three reasons why we need to fix our eyes on Jesus. And the first one is he's stable. Stability. Everybody say stability. We need a stable source of life in an unstable world. Anything that can be shaken will be shaken except for my God. Hallelujah. He will not be shaken. He will not be moved. And that's why he is our source. He is our strength. He is that beacon. He is that one saying recalculating. He's the one leading my steps and guiding our steps to everywhere we need to go. And if we keep our eyes on him, we will make it. It's not always, it's not always fun. We know that from personal and experience even right today that there's garbage in this world that hurts us but God will never ever ever forsake us so we need to stop forsaking him we need to stop forsaking him the Bible says he's stable Jesus Christ the same yesterday today and forever Hebrews chapter 13 our world is busier and crazier than ever and there's so much vying for your attention now I speak to teenagers a lot and so it's a lot so you know they don't know It's pretty bad for them. And there's so much vying for their attention, so much trying to get get them to do and pushing and prodding them wherever they want to go, so many vices. But the reality is it's just as bad for adults. It's just as bad for adults. You know, I tell teenagers it's different for them now in school than it was when I was in school and when you guys were in school because when you're in school, just say there was a bully in school or someone who's, who's who's a real jerk to you in school. Let's just say what it is, you know, a moros. Greek word for moron, you know, he was one, they were one of those, and every day you went to school, and he was picking on you, and calling you names, and making your life miserable, well, when you got on the bus, or you walked home, when you shut your door to your house, you were in your sanctuary, you were separated from that bully, from that idiot, from that moros, (laughs) and you got to enjoy your time with your family, you got to enjoy all the stuff, nothing was really pulling you, except for maybe the battles you were fighting in your head, which were real, But today when a kid goes home from school after getting mercilessly bullied, they go home and their phone beeps and their internet beeps and their Facebook beeps and their Snapchat beeps and they take their pain everywhere they go. There's no stability in our world for people. There's no place for anybody to hang their hat and say, I'm at peace today. Which is why we as the church need to fix our eyes on something stable to show the world that there is. There is something. And listen, you might be struggling right now trying to figure out where you fit, what's going on in your life today. And I'm here to tell you, we turn our eyes on, fix our eyes on Jesus, things begin to change. Life can be sobering, frustrating, and even terrifying. And many people struggle to find purpose in their life and their path. And the simple realities of life have become more and more confusing. And more and more people take their eyes off the stable God substituting it for something that just flashes light something that gives them something to hold on to now we need not substitute what god is doing in our life for something else anymore proverbs 29 18 says where there's no prophetic vision the people cast off restraint but blessed is he who keeps the law 
without a vision, without something, without something to take our attention, to take our heart, some guide to, to, to take us where we need to go, a, a reason to exist, people just do whatever feels right. And that's where we find ourselves in 21st, 2000, 21st century 2017 America. Whatever feels right, do it. It's not, a, it's not a new philosophy, it's a very old philosophy that has made its way back into the modern world. Whatever feels right, do it. And that's the world we live in. And that's what causes us grief, that's what causes us pain, that's what causes us frustration. And the Lord would simply say, fix your eyes on me. I haven't changed. You have gone through ups and downs, lefts and rights, and it's been miserable, but, but the Lord says, I haven't changed and I never will. I never will ever will. Everybody say, he's not changing. We need to fix our eyes on a beacon, a North Star for our life, our future, and our, and our hope. For the longest time, I've heard of the North Star. How many have ever heard of the North Star? I didn't realize it was, it was like the end of the ladle of the Little Dipper, or for those of you who are more like, like um, nerdy, it's, it's uh, <laughs> Ursa Major. <laughs> which is the Little Dipper, and Ursa, Mi Ursa Minor, and then Ursa Major is the Big Dipper. And so I said, I want to know where this North Star is. And so I looked online, and it said, the two little sections of the Big Dipper right here, and you got the thing here, and you got this thing here, and you got this, <sighs> the ladle. I'm going to eat soup with it. So the ladle, and then you got the bottom of the Big Dipper, and these two on the end, you kind of follow it up, and then there's a star in the sky. And I looked at it, and I said, oh, and there it is. And I found that that's the end of the Little Dipper. I'm like, oh, that's cool. That's cool. And the next night, guess what? It was there. Same spot. And the next night, it was in the same spot. And the next night, it was in the same spot. And a year from now, it'll be in the same spot. And, 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 and three months from now, it'll be in the same spot because that never changes. Do you want to see what our world looks like now? It's that. I don't know how... Can you turn these lights down for just one second? Because it's like really, really like light pollution up there. Just fast, Whew, right down. Kelsey will love that. You see this? This is, the way, this is our world. All of these things spinning out of control. Culture, fads, options, opportunities, jobs, friends, enemies, all this stuff going around in a cycle over and over and over again saying, look at me, look at me, look, I can help you today, I can help you tomorrow, I can help you wherever thing is going wrong, I can help you, I can help you, but dead center in the middle, unchanging, the North Star. You see, we can get caught in the peripheral of life. We can get caught fixing our eyes on the beauty of and the glory of our world. But the beauty and the glory of our world changes with every generation. You can turn the lights back on. The beauty and the glory of our world, what's beautiful and glorious today could be totally ugly and repulsive tomorrow. But that's where we find ourselves, living on the peripheral, living in the spin, living in the, the seduction of sin, the seduction of the universe, when meanwhile, in the very middle, in the very center, there's something that will not be moved. And that's where we need to live. While the world around you is spinning wildly out of control, people will reach out to grab you because you are connected to something that doesn't move. We need to fix our eyes on Jesus because he is stable. And we need him to be stable in this unstable world. Everybody say stable. stable. Number two, we need to fix our eyes on Jesus because he gives us strength. He gives us strength. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 12 verse 3, Consider him who endured for sin, from sinners such hostility against himself so that you may not grow weary, you may not grow faint-hearted. Jesus laid down his life for us. Amen. He laid down his life for you and me. He put it aside and he endured incredible hostility and pain from sinful people so that you and I could live a life where we don't faint and we don't grow wearisome and we don't grow faint hearted. That's strength. That is what God does. God gives his people strength to get through any situation that comes our way. There's a scripture in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. And it's kind of a much debated scripture, but it starts off with Paul saying, there came to me a messenger of Satan 
who was there to buffet me. And three times I prayed that the Lord would remove it. The Bible says right here, it says three times, in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 8 and 9, three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in your weakness. And this has been a debated scripture because the focus has always been on what was the thing. I think, I think, I think Paul left it quite vague on purpose because that's never been the focus of the scripture. But it becomes the focus of our scripture because we want to be right. We want to be right in our doctrines, in our theology. We want to be right and we want everybody else to be wrong. And when people come and tell us that we're wrong, we want to prove them that, so we want to know what is this? Is it a physical ailment? Is it a spiritual ailment? Is it a person? What is it? What is the messenger of Satan that's buffeting Paul? And God says, you're missing the point. God says, that's not why it's in there. And that's not why it's in there. I'll tell you right now, it's not why it's in there. We're not meant to find out what that is. Some people say it was Paul's eyesight. Some people say it was uh, an actual person that came and would always buffet him. And, you know, he prayed that the Lord would take him away and he wouldn't. There's just a lot of different talk about it. But it's not about the person. It's not about the spirit from Satan. It's about this. My grace is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect in your weakness. The point is that God makes our weaknesses his strength. The point is, is that where you're at your weakest, God is at his best. The point is that we don't have to dwell in our weaknesses and our weaknesses don't have to overcome us because his strength is perfect. Because where you struggle, he doesn't. Where you are in trouble, he's not. Where you can't get over it, he already has gotten over it. Jesus said, take heart, because you know what? You're going to face tribulation in this world, John chapter 16. But he said, take me of good cheer, because I've overcome the world. Everything that we struggle with on this planet has already been defeated by the power of God. And when we fix our eyes on him, that strength comes into our life. And though we struggle and though we are weak, we become strong in the Lord. Weakness, weakness. What is, what is our weaknesses? What, where, where do we struggle? Do we, are we anxious? We know the Bible says to be anxious for nothing, but in everything, in prayer and supplication, make your request made known to God, and the peace of God passes understanding, will guide your heart and soul and mind. Is it anxiety? I know it's a real thing. Last time I preached, I told you about my whole situation in the hospital where I thought I was dying myself. I know what anxiety feels like, but you know what? In those anxious moments when we put our, fix our eyes on that one spot in our world that hasn't moved, we find strength in our anxious moments. We, go back to the North Star picture, would you, could you? Would you, could you, ain't you gonna, there it is. In our anxious moments, our flesh wants us to focus on the spin. In our anxious moments, our flesh wants us to look at the spin, but God wants us to look at the center. God wants us to look at the place that hasn't moved, that hasn't changed, that is still bigger, it's still stronger. What is our weaknesses? We're afraid. We're afraid to share our faith. We're afraid to share our faith because we focus on the spin. We focus on the what ifs. What if they say this? What if they say that? What if they won't believe me? What if I don't know the answer to the question? What if, what if, what if, what if? And, and, and God says, I haven't moved. I'm the one who saves people, not you. You just tell them about me. It's not up to you anyway. It's up to God. And that makes us strong because we don't need all the answers. We just need to keep our eyes fixed on the one who has all the answers. Your life can be so much simpler if we'll just keep our eyes on the center. What's, what's your weakness? Is it alcohol? Are we drinking too much? I personally believe drinking at all is too much. It's a quiet church. Just saying that. That's, we won't go deep into that, but alcohol does kill people. Alcohol does destroy families. I'll tell you this, a little bit of meddling. My children will never, ever, 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 ever be able to sneak alcohol in my house because there's none. They'll never be able to go to the liquor cabinet or the wine cellar and get anything and get drunk because there's none. And that there's enough for me to say, don't ever touch the stuff. But for those of you who do, and you're bound to it, that doesn't have to be the thing that destroys you any longer. 
because your weakness, which could be alcohol, God can come into your life and you focus. You see, we focus on all the reasons why we should <laughs> and then it starts to destroy us. Meanwhile, we need to focus on what God can do in us. And he has the ability to help you empty every one of those bottles and never buy another one. I know that's kind of a difficult situation right now. Difficult statement right now about alcohol, but I'm telling you something. When you give God your weakest moments and you allow him to invade you with his strength, none of those weaknesses have the power to steal your life, to steal one more moment of your life. Whether it's smoking or sexual perversion or, 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 or depression or any of the stuff that you cannot seem to get over, we need to stop focusing on what's surrounding us and stop focusing on what hasn't moved. What hasn't moved. Everybody say he's strong. I'm going to ask uh, the band to come on up. The last thing I want to talk to you about is kind of my favorite. When, I don't know, who here has ever preached before somewhere? You just preach. Put your hand up. You preached before. All right, look at you preachers all over the place. You know when you have a message and there's one point you're just dying to get to, but you have to go through the other ones? Well, I'm about to get to the point that I've been dying to get to. I've been excited about this one. All the other stuff is good. All the other stuff is, is, is well, it's, it's, it's life-changing. I mean, come on. <laughs> it's good stuff. It's great stuff. But this one here, I am so excited about it because I look at every one of you and I see stories. I see stories from the beginning to the very end. I see that God has put inside every one of you a story that needs to be told. And a lot of us don't think we have a good story. A lot of us think our story is not worth the paper it would be penned on. Some of us think that our story isn't as good as somebody else's who has a more interesting story. When I was in Bible college, they did, a, a magazine came and did interviews of Bible school students. And I was one of them. And a friend of mine, I can't, well, yeah, I say a friend of mine, I don't even know his name. <laughs> so this other dude, <laughs> they did an interview on him. And my story was, I started going to church when I was, before, you know, about nine months before I was born, and I haven't stopped. <laughs> I didn't get into drugs, I didn't get into alcohol, I didn't turn away from the Lord. I struggled a little bit when I was an early teenager, but then at 14 years old, I started writing a prayer journal, I started leading worship, and the Lord has been faithful. You know, sometimes I feel like I'm the spoiled child that God has because He's done so many good things for me, and I feel like I don't do enough for Him, and God has just been so good, and here I am in Bible college getting ready to move on. I've never had any problems in my life at that point. I, you know, you know, everything was great. It was amazing, you know, and the other guy's story was he was a deep dark drug addict and all the stuff and he went to teen challenge and he was about to die and then God saved him and you know guess whose article they published it was, it was his it was his article they published his article and, and I struggled with that because I'm like does my story not count is my story not a good enough story for the people of God to hear some of you may look at your story because it's boring like mine and think I don't have nothing to offer it's a lie it's a lie. You have a story of faithfulness. You have a story of holiness. You have a story of, of majestic power of God leading you through things where other people failed. And other people here have stories where you're struggling right now with your belief in God. Is God real? You came maybe into this church today thinking a last, last ditch effort to, to see your life turn around. And I'm here to tell you, your story is far from being done. Others, you have the exciting story of crazy sin and the crazy redemption. What makes us so spectacular is that every one of us has a different story written by the same hand. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. I love this part. <laughs> story. God made the world, right? We all can agree on that, most of us anyway. We agree that Jesus was there. God spoke the world into existence. Let there be light. Or as Charlton Hess would say, let there be light. 
I often picture God's voice as Charlton Heston or Morgan Freeman, one or the other. And I hear tell that it's coming over there. That's a bad impression. I'm sorry. I'm moving on. I'm moving on. I'm moving, I'm moving on from that. <laughs> he spoke the world into existence and created. He wrote the genetic code of trees and water. And I mean, we, we, we can paint pictures and we can invent things, but God invented mountains and dirt. <laughs> God invented dirt. Everybody uses dirt. He invents, he invents stuff that's worth, you know, worth something. Sometimes we invent stuff that's not worth anything, like, you know, I don't know, I got nothing on that one, so I'm just kind of going off here. Let me go back to where I'm going here. He made everything. But he didn't just make the world. He created and wrote you. I want everybody to listen to me very closely. You. Make this personal. Put your hand on your chest and say, me. Me. You may not... You may not think that you were valuable. You may not think that you're, you may think God has forgotten about you. You may think it's too tough. No, no, God is still writing your story. There's an old song, theologically powerful song that Heather used to sing when she was five. I saw a video of it because I was only two at the time and Canadian. <laughs> and I saw a video of her pigtails going down like this with big, thick glasses. She would sit there like this. Some of you older folks who saw it know what I'm talking about. There really ought to be a sign upon my heart. But now she did it. I'm really dizzy right now. That's awful. I don't know how she did that. <laughs> He's still working on me to make me what I ought to be. It took him just a week to make the moon and the stars, the sun and the earth and Jupiter and Mars. How lovely and patient he must be because he, he's still working on me. He finished creation, but he's still working on us. He wrote the full story of creation, but he's still writing the story of your life. He knows how it's going to end. He knows how your story is going to end. Nobody anywhere at any time knows what you are capable of and what you can accomplish in this life like Jesus Christ does. You may think you have reached the pinnacle of what you can do, and I tell you the devil is a liar because there is more for you. There is more for you. Everybody say more. People can love you. People can study you, and they can get to know the inside, you inside and out. They can know everything there is to know about you, but nobody knows you like Jesus. Nobody knows what you are capable of like Jesus because he's the author of your existence from before earth was made until eternity comes and we walk the streets together. You see, he's the author of your life. Everybody say author. He's the author of your life. Now there's a difference between an author and an expert. Experts will have us, we believe we're experts of our own life. We know where we are. We know how good we can be. We know our past. We know our pain. We know what we struggle with. We know where we can't fit. We know because we're experts. But nobody knows a book like the author knows the book. Experts could tear apart a book, come up with all kinds of ideas what the author was thinking, but the author can say, uh, nope. Can tear you up and say, you know, you, you have a bad education, bad family, bad life bad habits, you're going nowhere. And the author can look at you and say, nope. That's not, that's not in his story. That's not in the next pages. That's not what it says in the back of his book. The back of his book, the back of her book says he is blessed and highly favored and he's changed the world for the kingdom of God. Because nobody knows you like the author. <laughs> Praise God. There are fictional works and all kinds of works, books, and, and literature, and I'm not a reader very much, but I am a geek and a nerd, so I like sci-fi weird things, and I'm sorry about that, but that's just me. And so one of, my, one of my favorite books that I've read that was fictional was The Lord of the Rings. Oh, you know, precious, yes, you know. I'm sorry about that, I just couldn't help myself. I got, I got problems, I got problems sometimes. <laughs> And throughout the years, people have tore J.R.R. Tolkien's work apart. He invented five languages that you can speak. 
that have syntax, grammar. I mean, he was a genius. And he put all these things together and for years, for decades, people have tore it apart to tell everybody what Tolkien was saying. And they've come up with some really good stuff. But nobody knows what he was really writing about except him. Because he's the author of the work. And when the author says something and somebody who has studied the author says something different, guess who I'm going to believe? I'm going to believe what the author has to say. And so when the author of your life says that you are going to win, that you are going to be blessed, that you are going to overcome, I'm going to believe what the author says, not what the expert says. I'm not going to believe even what you say about yourself because I know the one who wrote you and he has bigger things in store for your life than even what you have in store for your life. Praise God. Praise God. Your book can be torn apart from yourself, from experts, from family, friends. You're not smart enough. You're not from the right family. You were brought up in a broken home. Your father was an alcoholic. Your mother was abused. You were abused. You don't have the right education. You didn't get good grades. You didn't go to the right classes. This is you. And that sets boundaries for as far as you can go. Because experts say this is as far as you can go. This is your ceiling. Get used to working at the gas station because that's as good as it gets for you because of your life. Get used to struggling to make ends meet because you'll never be able to get a job that's better because this is as good as it gets for you. And then the Lord shows up. And he lifts your head because you don't feel good about yourself. And he takes out of his long lines of billions of books and he finds your name, he pulls it down. And you tell him why you can't do it. You tell him why you're struggling. You tell him why you can't serve God the way you should. You tell him why you can't live the way you should. You tell him why you can't be who you should be. And you try to give him excuses, excuses, excuses as to why you're stuck in the rut. And the Lord takes the book, opens to the last page, and he says, that's not what I, that's not what I have written down. He looks at the back of the book and he says, that's, this isn't where I have you ending up. He goes to the middle and he says, I see where you're struggling. I see where things aren't right. I see where things are tough. I see where things don't make sense. I see where things don't add up in your life and it's struggling for you and it's hurting your faith. But just a few pages over, I see a breakthrough. I see hope restored. I see strength restored. I see vision restored. I see love restored. I see purpose restored. What happened in those two pages? We fixed our eyes on Jesus. We fix our eyes on Jesus. The author and finisher of your faith and of my faith. Hallelujah. Can we just lift our hands right now and thank the Lord for that? 
Jesus, when he speaks, it takes a message that I've speak, spoken for like 30 minutes and it, it brings it down to just a five minute statement that your story is worth writing. Your story is not finished and it's not written by anybody but him today. Come on, let's praise him for that. Let's thank him that what's ahead is not what's behind. What a, what's ahead is better than what's behind. And we've got something spectacular coming. Our story is worth sharing. Our story is worth living. Our story is worth chasing down. Hallelujah. Come on, why don't you stand to your feet and praise the Lord a little bit in this house today. And just thank him for writing our story. Thank him for writing that story. Jesus, hallelujah. Thank you for my story. Thank you for who I am. That my, that my life is different. That my life is yours in your hands, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. So you might have come in here today wondering what all this was about in your life, why you're struggling and why things are tough and can church even help you? And I'm here to tell you that if we fix our eyes on Jesus, we're fixing our eyes on the one who knows what your end is supposed to be. He has already seen you at your finest. And he's going to help you get there. See, Jesus Christ paid a terrible price for us. He died on a cross and was brutally beaten and died on a cross because the sin entered humanity and separated us from God. Sin demanded death. We could no longer go to heaven. But Jesus died for us. Doesn't that just, that blows me away after 30 some odd years, 30, 35, I know how exactly how old I am. <laughs> 35 years of life, it blows my mind that Jesus would do that for me. He did it for you. The Bible says if we we'll believe in our heart and confess with our mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, then we'll be saved, ready for heaven, and our story will never be the same again. And I'm going to ask if there's anybody here today with heads bowed and eyes closed. If there's anybody here today that your story that is written about you does not include God in it yet. It does not include you giving your heart to Jesus and saying, Lord, come into my life. I wanna, I wanna serve you. I wanna be with you for eternity. That's, that's not there yet. I'm here to tell you today is a good day to write it in. Today's a good day for you to fix your eyes on Jesus. Maybe for the very first time in your life to say, God, I want to give you my life and I want to start over. And I'll tell you, he will lead you down paths and lead you down a life that you never thought you could. But it all starts with you making a decision to say, Jesus, I want to serve you and I want to follow you. Is there anybody here that would say, Pastor Paul, I want to give my life to Christ and start this new chapter in my life. I want you to raise your hand. Is there anybody at all? Just go ahead and raise your hand and say, that's me. I want to give my life to Christ today. I want to start over right now. Is there anybody at all? Praise God. Jesus. Praise God. Just a few more moments. Anybody in the balcony? Praise God. Hallelujah. 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 We're going to do the altar a little differently today because we want to end off a little differently, but I just want us to make some, some statements of faith in our, in our seats. I mean, we're not going to like the repeating thing or anything like that, but I know from experience, I am 35. That's older than some, much younger than others. <laughs> I'm sorry, I can't help myself. I know from experience that life comes at you hard and that sometimes you mess up. And there are times when you lose this, right? How many would say, I've, I've lost that before? Just raise your hand up real high. I've lost that before. Okay, there's hands up all over the place. We've all lost this before. 
We've all know what it feels like to be wandering and trying to find where we fit. And I'm here today to tell you that that doesn't have to be your future, your life. That from this moment forward, we can keep our eyes fixed on Jesus through thick and thin. And we just want to pray together as a body of believers because that is what's going to help us as we walk out this door. Because when you, when you come down, can you come down here and we pray for you? We're going to do that tonight. I'm sure Vinny's going to preach tonight. And he's, going to, and he's going to come and we're going to have an altar service down here that's going to blow our socks off. It's going to be amazing. And we need that in our life. We also need to leave this place this morning with a vision. We need to be able to see Jesus out there. Sometimes it's really easy to see Jesus here. And we come down, I've seen it with teenage work. We come down and we're excited. Everything's really excited. They're jumping and screaming and crying and loving Jesus. And the next week they come back with just as much baggage as they had before. And then they get excited again. And the next week it's the same thing. Why? It's because out there is where we need to learn to fix our eyes on the Lord. We need to fix our eyes out there. So what I want us to do is I want us to pray for each other. I want us to pray for the people in our row. I want us to just put our hands on their shoulders. So go ahead right now, put your hands on their shoulders. And, and if you're in a row by yourself, sit with, sit with other people and be nice. <laughs> if you're in a row by yourself, find somebody else and just put your hand on their shoulders. And I want you to just pray for them, that the Lord will help them fix their eyes on them. All right, just pray for them today.